We'll be top 10 to 10. Today is May the 23rd. Your host, Dan Wright, right at FargoLake.com. And these are the top 10 stories. Let's start with the wrong place. Story number 10 from Freedom of the Press Foundation. Journalists argue in the New York Times that publishing decisions should ultimately be made by government. Uh, this ran, I guess, yesterday. It's a review of Glenn Greenwald's book, No Place to Hide, which gives the background on the Snowden uh, disclosures and his, I guess, uh, trip of meeting him in Hong Kong. This is from Barry Eisler. Uh, Glenn Greenwald spends the last third of his excellent new book, No Place to Hide, exposing the mentality and function of pseudo-journalists like David Gregory, who are in fact better understood as courtiers to power, but it was kind of Michael Kinsley to offer himself up today as living proof of Greenwald's argument in a New York Times book review, Kinsley says, the question who decides what to publish, it seems clear, at least to me, that the private companies that own newspapers and their employees should not have the final say over the release of government secrets and a free pass to make them public with no legal consequences in a democracy, which, case Greenwald, we still are, that decision must ultimately be made by the government. Pause for a moment to let that sink in. How can the government have ultimate decision-making power consistent with the First Amendment with regard to publication of leaks? As Kinsley himself goes to, on to say, you can't square this circle, indeed, unless you believe the government should be able to impose prior restraint on the publication of anything it deems secret, unless you want to argue that the Constitution should be amended accordingly. So uh, this editorial or re book review, actually, uh, by Michael Kinsley is getting uh, it's clarifying who stands what. If you really believe the government should be able to control what you publish, then you're not really a journalist. Uh, story number nine from The Guardian, Pentagon Report. Scope of intelligence compromised by Snowden's staggering. A top se secret Pentagon report to assess the damage to national security from the leak of classified uh, NSA documents by Edward Snowden concluded, quote, the scope of the compromised knowledge related to U.S. intelligence capabilities is staggering. The Guardian has obtained a copy of the Defense Intelligence Agency's Classified Damage Assessment in response to a uh, Freedom of Information Act lawsuit filed against the Department of Defense earlier this year. The heavily redacted 39-page report was prepared in December and is titled DOD Information Review Task Force 2 Initial Assessment. But while the DIA report describes the damage to U.S. intelligence capabilities as grave, the government still refuses to release any specific details to support this conclusion. So uh, another report about these disclosures being incredibly damaging, threatening national security, and yet again, nothing to back it up other than the statement itself. Story number eight. Um, this is actually a New York Times editorial from yesterday about this new U.S. Freedom Act, a surveillance bill that falls short. A year ago would have been unimaginable for the House to pass a bill to curtail the government's abusive surveillance practices. The document leaked by Edward Snowden, however, finally shocked lawmakers from both parties into action, producing promises that they would stop the government from collecting the telephone data of ordinary Americans and would bring greater transparency to its domestic spying programs. Unfortunately, the bill passed by the House on Thursday falls far short of those promises and does not live up to its title, the USA Freedom Act. Because of last-minute pressure from a recalcitrant Obama administration, the bill contains loopholes that dilute the strong restrictions in an earlier version, potentially allowing the spy agencies to continue much of their phone data collection. Still, the bill finally begins to reverse the trend of reducing civil liberties in the name of fighting terrorism as embodied in various versions of the Patriot Act. And if the Senate fixes its flaws, it could start to rebuild confidence that Washington will get the balance right. Um, the changes demanded by the White House would also weaken the provision allowing internet companies to report how often the government made requests for their data. Most of these companies now say they don't support the bill. And the role of declassifying, declassifying court decisions would go from the Attorney General to the Director of National Intelligence, the last person who should do it. So this is actually, so Obama and friends snuck in some provisions to this, to the USA Freedom Act that actually makes it worse than current at law, although they're not following current law, <laughs> this would make it even worse. So, uh, And this current form, the U.S. Freedom Act, uh, is something to oppose. 
Story number seven, uh, Microsoft, this is from Engadget, Microsoft wins case to block FBI request for customer data. Um, when Microsoft said last year that it's committed to protecting its customers from government data requests, it wasn't messing around. Microsoft General Counsel and Executive VP Brian Smith recently revealed that the software giant successfully challenged an FBI national security letter that tried to seek basic information from one of its enterprise customers. The letters apparently had a non-disclosure provision that would have prevented Microsoft from telling the customer in question about the request. Microsoft challenged that provision in Seattle's federal court, stating that it was, quote, unlawful and violated our constitutional right to free expression. And when you know it, the FBI withdrew the letter rather than go to court and lose. <laughs> in which case, that would set a precedent that they couldn't do it to anybody else, particularly companies that can't pay for legal counsel like Microsoft can. Smith said in a blog post that such requests are rare, but it's still good to know the Redmond company is continuing to do what it can to be transparent. Story number six is from The Diplomat. China-Russia military ties deepen with naval drill in East China Sea. The joint naval drill is another example of the growing military, economic, and political ties between China and Russia. This comes on the heels of, um, let's see, well, actually, this comes before the uh, $300 billion gas deal. On Wednesday, China announced it plans to hold joint naval drills with Russia in the East China Sea later this month. That happened. Uh, these drills are regular exercises held by China and Russia's navies. Uh, Voice of America reports that the joint naval drills will be held in late May off the coast of Shanghai. A uh, few details have been released about the scope. We now know that um, these involved uh, actually ballistic missile tests, so not exactly confidence inspiring. Story number five is from uh, the Clarion Ledger, which is one of the Gannett companies. Authorities say the vice chairman of the Mississippi Tea Party and two other men conspired with Clayton Kelly to photograph U.S. Senator Thad Cochran's bedridden wife in her nursing home and create a political video against Cochran. Mark Mayfield of Ridgeland, an attorney and state and local Tea Party leader, was arrested Thursday along with Richard St Sager a Laurel Elementary School PE teacher and high school soccer coach. Police said they also charged John Beachman, Ma Mary of Hadesburg, but he was not taken into custody because of extensive medical conditions, unquote. All face felony conspiracy charges. Sager was also charged with felony tampering with evidence, and Mary faces two conspiracy counts. The arrests of Mayfield, well-known in political business and legal circles, caused shock in Mississippi. In a criminal case, an election that had already that had already had Mississippi in the national spotlight. Hmm. Mayfield's attorneys uh, quickly posted cash for Mayfield's release on two hundred fifty thousand dollar bond. Uh, then Kelly's attorney said the case appears to be politically driven. It's all about politics. I guess we'll see about that. Story number four. Uh, this is from Tom Steyer, who's a uh, billionaire and founder of Next Gen Climate, also funder of it, I think he's agreed to put in $100 million. Climate change is on the ballot. This is a blog he wrote for the Huffington Post. The academic debate on climate change is settled. It is here, it is human caused, and it is already having devastating impact on our communities. But some political leaders deny scientific facts and evidence. They believe the truth is not good for their careers, and when faced with irrefutable evidence, too many politicians choose to fall back on the classic defense. Quote, I have no awareness of that, your honor, unquote. President Reagan once said, when you can't make them see the light, make them feel the heat. Well, I think it's about time we heed President Reagan's advice and make candidates standing on the wrong side of history feel the heat this November. So he goes through the litany of the effects of climate change. Um, and then he talks about what he's going to do about it at some point, I believe. That's why my organization, Next Gen Climate, will be working in states across the country where climate is on the ballot this November. Fortunately, there are candidates who are willing to lead on issues of climate change, leaders who understand this is not just an environmental issue, but a pocketbook issue for voters. Bringing climate change to the forefront means making politicians feel the heat. So he's apparently going to spend $100 million to fight uh, in various states. I, I got a breakdown somewhere, actually, Florida, Iowa, Maine, and it's going to be about... Um, He's going, to, he's going to spend money to, I guess, label candidates anti-science and help their opponents. And he's got a lot more money to give if he wants to, so that should be interesting to watch. Story number three, 
This is an interesting report from Debt and Society. Uh, borrowing against the future, the hidden costs of finance in U.S. higher education. Um, it goes through Wall Street profits on for-profit colleges, the cost of colleges, institutional borrowing. Uh, it's just an interesting read if you have a moment. I might write something up about this article. Um, story number two, this is from Charles Krauthammer in the Washington Post. Who made the pivot to Asia? Putin. On Wednesday, it finally happened, the pivot to Asia. No, not the United States. It was Russia that turned east. In Shanghai, Russian President Vladimir Putin and Chinese President Xi Jinping signed a spectacular energy deal, $400 billion of Siberian natural gas to be exported to China over 30 years. This is huge. By indelibly linking producer and consumer, the pipeline alone is a $70 billion infrastructure project. It deflates the post-Ukraine Western threat, mostly empty but still very loud, to cut European imports of Russian gas. Putin has just defiantly demonstrated that he has other places to go. The Russia-China deal also makes a mockery of U.S. boasts who have isolated Russia because of Ukraine. Not even Germany wants to risk serious ruptures with Russia. And now Putin has just ostentatiously unveiled a signal 30-year energy partnership with the world's second largest economy. Some isolation. So this is a, Obama's stated policy to pivot to Asia apparently has fallen pretty flat. Went to Japan last month, also seeking a major trade agreement that would symbolize and cement a pivotal strategic alliance. He came home empty-handed. Does the Obama foreign policy team even understand what is happening? For them, the Russia-China alliance is simply more retrograde. So in terms of the China uh, deal, Russia's already said, okay, fine, if you want to cut us off from Europe, we'll go to China. And uh, Obama's Japan deal fell through, so it, the optics were pretty bad. And the number one story, there's truly fried our leg. Fighting breaks out in East Ukraine as Putin claims there's a full-scale civil war. Uh, tensions between Kiev and separatists have been rising in days leading up to Sunday's May 25th presidential election. But now the scale of battles has led Russian President Vladimir Putin to declare that Ukraine is in a full-scale civil war. Today, fighting broke out near Donetsk, leaving two dead, which came on the heels of another battle yesterday that left 13 Kiev fighters dead, all of which raises questions as to how orderly an election can occur, uh, which occurs in two days. So uh, May 25th is the actual election date, so that's Sunday. And uh, the question is whether they can actually get people to the polls or will, it, will they even have a vote. Uh, separatists have proclaimed their intention to not allow the presidential vote in towns they have declared in, that have declared independence from the gang in Kiev. He came to power overthrowing the democratically elected president with the assistance from the U.S. and the EU. Part of the opposition to elections is due to the interim government in Kiev being seen as illegitimate. Whether there is a full-scale civil war or not, the hope that this election is going to stabilize the political situation in Ukraine appears misplaced. Uh, so I guess we'll see what happens Sunday. And that is the Top 10 of 10. If you have a story you'd like me to feature in the Top 10 of 10, please tweet me. At Dennis Wright, and be sure to read the stories, all the stories at FireArgrade.com. Thanks. See you later.